Well, will you turn with me again, please, to this psalm that we read just before the prayer there, Psalm 66. Psalm 66, and I've just entitled this message tonight very simply, God Knows What He Is Doing. God Knows What He Is Doing. We're going to be thinking tonight about the middle section of Psalm 66, beginning at verse number 10 and concluding at verse number 15. I read this little portion a number of days ago in my daily readings and just took a few notes about it because it really challenged my heart and I felt it was very, very appropriate for so many people in these days that we find ourselves in. Psalm 66 is a wonderful psalm of praise and worship. We're not told explicitly who wrote the psalm, But the title there is simply given to the chief musician, a song or a psalm. And that little title would indicate that this was one of the psalms that would have been sung in the public assembly and the public worship of the children of Israel. No historical background is given to the writing of the psalm or the circumstances in which it was recorded But it is a very relevant psalm, and there is so much that we can dig into and drill into with this psalm. So much application by way of the children of Israel, and also by way of the church, and also by way of the individual believer. You'll notice from the very first verse that it is a psalm that calls for universal worship. Make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands. And then there's a lovely phrase at the end of verse number two that stood out before me. Make his praise glorious. Make his praise glorious. Did you ever think about the implications of that? Make his praise glorious. This ought to be our chief endeavor. What a calling in life we have as as God's people, those of us who are saved. What a calling we have What a challenge is set before us. What a great privilege is set before us here. And at the same time, what a delight to make the praise of our God glorious. Praise and worship should never be dull and dreary. It should never be without feeling and without emotion. It should never be without thanksgiving and joy. Our public praise and our private worship should always be with a sense of reverence, a sense of awe, as we think about the greatness and the majesty of our great God and our great Savior. Make His praise glorious. That ought to be the very pursuit of our lives. Verse number four is another verse that stood out. All the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee, they shall sing to thy name, Selah. Think about that. Sometimes we read verses like that very quickly, all the earth shall worship thee, but the Word of God says, now just stop and think about that, all the earth shall worship thee. I believe there's coming a great and a glorious day whenever Christ Himself will reign upon this earth. I'm not sure how that's all going to work out, but the Word of God is very clear from Revelation chapter 11 and verse number 15 that there's a day coming whenever the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. And there's a day coming, the Bible says, whenever all of the earth shall worship the name of our Lord. But verse 10 through to verse number 15 is the section that I want to consider tonight that really deals with the subject of chastening. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. That's the teaching of much of Hebrews chapter 12. And it's also the teaching of so much of God's Word in other places. And yet in chastisement, whether it's collectively as a nation, ecclesiastically as part of the body of Christ, or individually and personally, God has a purpose in chastisement. It is purposeful, it is certainly needful, and it is always done in love. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. 
trial, adversity, and trouble are things that we do not look for, but things that we do experience. And yet, as I think about these verses, Psalm 66, verse 10 to verse number 15, I come to the absolute conviction that in all things, in this whole situation that our land is in with this lockdown and our world is in and all of the alarm and all of the fear and all of the frustration and all of the uncertainty that comes with that, and as that affects the people of God, as that affects our public worship, as that affects us as a church family, as that affects us within our homes and within our employment and with our children and their schooling and all of the things that go with it and all of the uncertainty about it. And I read these words and I read these words in my devotions. I came to the conviction once again, God knows what he's doing. I just want to highlight three things from these verses. Verses 10 to the first part of verse number 12 speak of an affliction. The affliction described. Verse 10, For thou, O God, hast proved us, thou hast tried us, as silver is tried, thou broughtest us into the net, thou ledst affliction upon our loins, thou caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. The affliction described. Once again, we have a portion of God's blessed and holy word that indicates that Christians, God's people, believers do ultimately face trial. In fact, Psalm 34 and verse number 19 says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. I think we see in the Scriptures very clearly the great error of so much of the modern gospel and the modern charismatic movement that if you're walking with God and you love the Lord, there'll be no sickness, there'll be no adversity, there'll be no trouble, there'll be no trial, there'll be no loneliness, there'll be no affliction, there'll be no trouble, there'll be no oppression, there'll be none of these things, but it's almost living above the clouds. But the experience of the psalmist certainly was that, wasn't that. The experience of the patriarch certainly wasn't that. The experience of the apostles certainly wasn't that. We think of John, we think of Paul, we think of Peter, we think of James. And if we read books like Fox's Book of Martyrs, we read about the early church and the great affliction and adversity that they experienced. And here we have that adversity described. You'll notice there in verse number 10, verse number 11, and verse number 12, that the psalmist takes time to record and note very clearly the sovereignty in the affliction. Five times the author of the psalm, it is likely that it's David, although we cannot say that categorically, but five times the author of the psalm, in reference to affliction, uses the word thou. Thou, O God, has proved us. Thou hast tried us. Thou broughtest us into the net. Thou ledst affliction upon our loins. Thou hast caused men to ride over our heads. The author realizes that whatever has happened in the history of the nation of Israel, whatever has happened in his own personal circumstances and the circumstances of those around him, however hard, however difficult, however confusing those circumstances might be, that God has ultimately been the author in the whole thing. In all of our trials and in all of our affliction, we need to learn to trace the hand of God. And if we cannot do that at the same time, we need to learn to trust in the heart of God, that God is sovereign that God moves and works in providence. There's a hymn that we sang at our wedding. It's a favorite of mine, Like a River Glorious. Is God's perfect peace over all victorious in its bright increase. And the last verse of that hymn, every joy or trial falleth from above, traced upon our dial by the Son of love. We may trust Him wholly, all for us to do, those who trust him wholly, find him wholly true. William Cooper, we often quote the words of that great hymn that he wrote. He wrote many great hymns, but God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps 
in the sea. He rides upon the storm. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. You see, it seems that the old preachers and the old theologians and the old missionaries and the old evangelists and the old hymn writers and the old saints of God, as they took the Word of God at face value, it seems that they took with it for granted the sovereignty of God. And yet we're living now in days whenever even in the church we spell man with a capital M, and sometimes it seems as if we almost spell God with a small g. And we rob God of of His sovereignty. And whenever things happen, we almost act as if God hasn't had a hand in it at all, and maybe God has been taken by surprise, and we need to get away and tell God all about this, and advise God perhaps as to what He should do but the psalmist was different. He realized that there was a sovereign hand in all of, all of his trials and in all of his afflictions. The book of Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11 and verse number 12, in whom we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. God knows what He is doing. He's known from all eternity. He knows what He's doing in your life tonight. He knows what He's doing in your home tonight. He knows what He's doing in our town tonight. He knows what He's doing in our country tonight. He knows what He's doing in this world of ours tonight. The sovereignty of the affliction. But notice, maybe in a little bit more detail, the imagery of the affliction. Thou, O Lord, hast proved us, tested us, searched us. You've proved us, Lord. And often the way God proves His people is by the way of difficulty. If all were easy, if all were bright, where would the cross be? Where would the fight? But in the hardness, God gives to you chances of proving that He is true. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, Moses said to the children of Israel in the second verse, Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or no. And so Moses says to the Israelite people, Look back over the last 40 years. Think of all of the trials, all of the difficulties, all of the uncertainties, all of the battles, all of the hungers, all of the weariness, all of the sin that you fell into. And look back over it all. And he says, that was the way that the Lord led you. And he did it. And it was hard and it was difficult and it was long and it was a wilderness. But he did it to prove you. Thou hast proved us. Then, he says, thou hast tried us as silver is tried. This speaks of the fiery trial. Malachi 3 and verse 3 speaks about the Savior. He shall be a, set as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi. Job says, he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Peter said, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. And all through Scripture, we're introduced to the fiery trial. As young people, we used to sing a lovely old chorus. Purify my heart. Make me be as gold and precious silver. And then the chorus said, refiner's fire. My heart's one desire is to be holy. Set apart for you, my master, ready to do your will. Refiner's fire, make my heart as gold and as silver. So much of the imagery that we read on in this psalm seems to have reference and correspondence to the children of Israel as a nation. Verse 11, thou broughtest us into the net. You remember how the children of Israel coming out of Egypt were entangled before the Red Sea? And the Egyptian says, look, see, the wilderness has shut them in 
and they are entangled in the land. And the images there of a great net, the Red Sea before them, the wilderness on either side, Egypt behind them, and thousands of Pharaoh's soldiers marching on to try to bring them back to Egypt. Thou broughtest us into the net. Thou broughtest us into the net. Lord, you led us out of Egypt. You led us into the wilderness. You led us to the brink of the Red Sea. And it was as if, Lord, a big net had been thrown over us. And we were entangled and ensnared and we couldn't seem to find a way out. Have you ever felt like that? That you've been led into a, a net, perhaps? I think many feel like this at this present time, that we're entangled somehow. How do we get out of this situation? How will things ever return to normality? What about the family? What about me aged parents? What about that brother or sister that's got special needs, perhaps? Or that loved one who's lonely and health is failing and the years are passing on and what about the children and what about my employment and what's it all going to look like when this is over? We can worry about those things and feel that the Lord has maybe brought us into a great net. Thou ledst affliction upon our loins. Does that speak to us tonight of the hard labor that the children of Israel faced in Egypt under their taskmasters there? Because it says then in verse number 12, Thou hast caused men to ride over our heads. Israel were ruled by their enemies while in bondage in Egypt. And sometimes I wonder about this whole world system that we're living in and all of the globalists wanting to come together. And I often wonder, are we going to be led into a situation where men will ride over our heads and seek to trample underfoot the church of Jesus Christ and oppress and deflect and bind and hold us back from from evangelizing and from worshiping and from practicing our faith. I think we see little, little indicators of that over the last little while. Stand up for the biblical account of marriage. You can be accused of all sorts of things. Speak against sin. You're accused of hate crime. And I think maybe there's going to be hard days perhaps ahead for the church. And then it goes on to say in verse number 12, we went through fire. The fiery trial is real. If you could meet Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego someday in glory and ask them the question, what did you feel like whenever you wouldn't bow down and you wouldn't worship the images of Babylon and you wouldn't compromise your faith and you purposed in your heart you're going to obey God and then you got the news that you'd been summoned and you were facing that fiery furnace, how did you feel? And certainly they didn't back down. They said our God is able to deliver us. But if not, we're still not going to bow the knee. They weren't fortune tellers. They couldn't tell the future. They knew that God was in control. They knew that our God knows what he's doing and he's able to deliver us. But if not, we go to be with him, which is, which is far better. And then it speaks about going through the waters. That we went through fire and through water. That reminds me of that lovely text in Isaiah chapter 43 and verse number 2. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. So often whenever we get a theme in Scripture, that theme runs like a thread through God's great tapestry of Holy Scripture. And we'll see the same principles and the same themes and the same thoughts being brought by different men, all being led and inspired by the Spirit of God. I wonder tonight, do you feel that you're being proved? Do you feel that you're being tried? Do you feel that you've been brought into a net? Do you feel that someone has laid, laid affliction upon your loins and you feel weakened by it? Maybe people riding over your heads, you feel maybe you're going into a fire or you're entering into deep, deep waters. I think of the words of that lovely old hymn in shady green pastures, so rich and so sweet. God leads his dear children along. 
when waters cool flow, bathes the weary one's feet, God leads his dear children along. Sometimes on the mount where the sun shines so bright, sometimes in the valley in the darkest of night, though sorrows befall us and evils oppose, though through grace we can conquer, defeat all our foes, away from the mire, away from the clay, God leads his dear children along, away up on the glory, eternity's day, he leads his dear children along, some through the waters, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. The affliction described. Notice the second thing here tonight, the second part of verse number 12, the abundant deliverance. But thou broughtest us out into a wealthy place. I don't know if you ever spend time reading the Puritans. Some of them are easier to read than others, but they're certainly all very profitable. But maybe one of the most easy of the Puritans to read would be Thomas Watson. He seemed to have a great way with words and communicating great truth very concisely. Uh, John Owen was maybe a little bit different. I always find him very, very wordy. But Thomas Watson was able to bring profound truth and just succinctly summarize it in a lovely way. He said this once, affliction may be lasting, but it is not everlasting as far as the Christian is concerned. Affliction may be lasting, but it is not everlasting. And that truth is proved by this psalm. Did you notice there the divine intervention? The psalmist from verse 10 to the middle of verse number 12 has been speaking about affliction. And he sees the sovereign hand of God in it. He speaks about all of these different things, the flood and the fire and the waters and the net and the trial and, and the proving and the affliction and all of the rest of it. And then he says at the uh, end of verse number 12, but thou broughtest us out into a wealthy place, divine intervention. In a situation that was beyond his control, the psalmist at last rejoices that God stepped in. Lord, it was all beyond our control. Lord, you were leading and guiding and allowing things to happen and ordaining things and weaving all of these things together into your great plan and into your great purpose. And I felt so afraid. I felt afflicted. I felt crushed. I felt pressed down. I felt the heat of the fiery trial. I felt the darkness and the depths of the waters. I felt weakened by the affliction that was laid upon our loins. But then, Lord, you came and you stepped in, but thou, O Lord, broughtest us out into a wealthy place, but thou. How often can the Christian look back at times in their lives whenever they thought, how am I going to get out of this? How will I ever find a way? How will I ever get through this? Maybe treatment for cancer. Maybe bereavement. Maybe a tremendous tragedy that that come into the, the home or into the private life. There'd be awful problems in the home, relationship problems maybe, difficulties in the workplace. There'd be problems even with brothers and sisters in Christ and all sorts of things can happen. And maybe you've been there and you've looked at, at where you're at and you say, how can, how can I ever get out of this? And then you get to that place where you experience God stepping in, but... Thou, Lord, my heart was overwhelmed, but Lord, you came. Lord, you stepped in, but thou ledest us out. Did you ever look at the but God statements in Scripture? Joseph says, as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. There's a lovely verse in Acts chapter 7 and verse uh, number 9. And again, it speaks of G uh, Joseph uh, and the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with them. But God, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died with us. With men, this is impossible 
but with God nothing shall be impossible. What about 1 Corinthians 10 and 13? What a verse that is. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will with the temptation make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. Whatever your situation is tonight, remember, but God. God knows what He is doing. Divine intervention, divine liberation, but Thy broadest us out. Do you notice the contrast there between verse 11 and verse 12? Verse 11 says, Thou broughtest us into the net. Verse 12 says, But Thou broughtest us out. God in control all the time. Think of the Israelite people again in Egypt. And God brought them out. Brought them out by the blood of the Lamb. And as the old patriarch says, he brought them out that he might bring them in. Brought them out of Egypt. And lastly, brought them into the, the land of promise. David testified of it personally. In, in Psalm 40, in his great testimony, Psalm, speaking about what the Lord had done for his soul, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry, and brought me up also out of an horrible pit. He brought me out. Divine intervention, divine liberation. God is in the business of deliverance. Psalm 34, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Sometimes in the trial, in the affliction, we think it's never going to be any different. Did you ever feel that? That way? This is how it's going to be from now on. Even whenever you feel physically weak or infirm or sick, that thought sometimes enters your mind, doesn't it? This is maybe how it's going to be for the rest of my days. Or whenever you're feeling downcast and low and discouraged and you think this is how I'm ever going to feel and this is how it's ever going to be. But by and by, the Lord comes and He delivers. And He brings us out. little phrase that comes up in the Bible so many times, and it came to pass. And he'll bring this whole situation to pass as well in our land and in our nation and in our churches. Divine intervention, divine liberation, divine expansion. He brought me out. Where did he bring him? He brought us out into a wealthy place, into the promised land itself. The little phrase there, a wealthy place, literally denotes a well-watered place. A land flowing with milk and honey, the wealthy place, or the well-watered place, lush green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He maketh me to lie down in, in green pastures. You see, God is, is no man's debtor whenever he brings us out of our trials. He always makes it good. And at last, whenever all of our trials in this earth is over, the Lord will bring us into a wealthy place, heaven itself, a well-watered place. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. I got a lovely promise many years ago in the book of Isaiah, chapter 58 and verse number 11. The Lord shall guide thee continually. And satisfy thy soul. In drought, make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be like a watered garden, like a spring of water <coughs> whose waters fail not. What a God we have. Times of barrenness, times of drought. God is able to bring us into the wealthy place, the well-watered place, and God is able to make us fruitful even there. You know, often the trial serves to bring us into a new place with God. I think during this lockdown, many people are able to testify to that. I'm able to read my Bible more. I'm able to pray more. I see things now in a different light. I've been living for so many temporal things and being overcome with the rat race and materialism and all of the things that make up life on earth for so many. And now that all of those things have been stripped back and I can't go to the sporting events anymore, I can't go to the places of entertainment anymore, I can't maybe even go to the workplace anymore, and everything's just now been stripped back, and I now see the things that really matter. 
And it's as if God has now brought me into a new place, into a wealthy place, into a well-watered place, because now I'm in the Scriptures. Many people are speaking about that sort of thing and how this has put a lot of things in perspective for them. And I would hope that whenever God's people are enabled to meet again publicly right across our world and here in our own little flock, that we might come back and personally we will all find ourselves in a new place with God, well-watered place, a wealthy place. God can bring us into that place even tonight into a new place with himself, a well-watered place, fruitful, flourishing, refreshing, reviving. The affliction described, verses 10 to 12, the abundant deliverance, the second part of verse 12, then verses 13 to 15, the aftermath detailed. The Lord's deliverance in the life of the psalmist is marked by a spirit of praise and thanksgiving that he expresses in a very practical way. Just after he testifies to how the Lord has brought him into all of these trials and afflictions, and then how he testifies that the Lord has brought him out, but thou broughtest us out into a wealthy place, well, what will our response be to this? And if God delivers us from this affliction and this trial that our world is presently in, how will Christian people respond right across the world? Will look at the response of the psalmist, he responds in a very practical way. He says in verse 13, I will go into thy house, attendance at the sanctuary. I will go into thy house. That's the first place the psalmist thinks about. What am I going to do now that God has delivered me and now that God has brought us out of her trial, out of her affliction, what are we going to do? Well, the first thing he says I'm going to do, I'm going to go to the house of God and I'm going to publicly worship him and publicly testify that the Lord has intervened in my experience. You know, the house of the Lord ought to be the first place that the young convert goes. I think it's so, so important if God brings you out of the affliction of sin and the guilt of sin and delivers you and brings you into the kingdom of Christ and of God, the first thing that you need to do is get to a Bible-preaching, gospel-preaching church where there's prayer, where there's fellowship, where there's evangelism, where there's teaching, and get to the house of God and publicly nail your colors to the mast as the apostle Paul did. He is said to join himself to the disciples. These people are going to be my people. I'm going to the house of the Lord. His thanksgiving, the psalmist's thanksgiving, was public. He wanted to worship the Lord publicly. He wanted people to see him go to the place of worship. Friends, let's not make any mistake about it. God demands that his people publicly worship him. He expects his people to publicly worship him. And he asks us to do that, to confess him publicly to worship Him publicly. Because the Lord Jesus Christ died publicly upon a cross for us. And His ministry was by and large a public ministry. Yes, He spent time alone and in the secret place with God, but He was out and about among the people publicly. And He wants His people publicly to worship and to magnify His name. He said, if you deny me before men, I will also deny you before my Father which is in heaven. And the Word of God from the opening books right through to Revelation is full of accounts of public worship. I cannot understand any person who comes to the Bible and says that there is warrant for me personally that I don't have to go to a place of worship and go to the house of God and worship God publicly. If you're able to get onto your feet, and you're able to go to your place of employment and your places of amusement and entertainment, and you've got the faculties and the physical ability to be out and about. If you're a Christian, you should be in the house of God for public worship. Whenever the tab tabernacle was erected in the wilderness, 
all of the tribes met around the tabernacle and they pitched their tents toward it and they met at the gate of assembly. And then the same thing happened whenever the temple was built. And then in the days of Christ, they still had their temple and they had their synagogues. And then after the resurrection, all of the New Testament churches were established. And so much of the New Testament was written to believers who met together publicly in a place of worship to testify that God had done a work in their lives and they wanted to praise His name, they wanted to seek His face, they wanted to be with other believers, they wanted to be around the Word. It was their testimony and it was their delight. I'll never understand professing believers who will not go to church and almost blame God for it and say, God has told me something different than He's told everybody else from Genesis to Revelation. He's told me something different. The psalmist says, I will go into thy house. Lord, you've brought me out of my affliction. How do I repay you? I can't, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to the house of God. I'm going to worship. I'm going to praise his name. I'm going to be with God's people. Attendance of the sanctuary. Offering of sacrifice. I will go into thy house with burnt offerings. Verse 15, I will offer unto thee burnt sacrifices of fatlings with the incense of rams I will offer bullocks with goats. Selah, think about that. He's coming with sacrifice. Now, God's grace in trial and God's deliverance from trial has brought a spirit of sacrifice into the psalmist's heart. Now, we do not offer God atoning sacrifices. Jesus Christ our Lord has offered one sacrifice for sins forever. But 1 Peter 2, 5 speaks about offering up spiritual sacrifices. What are those spiritual sacrifices? Well, Hebrews 13, 15, the sacrifice of praise. Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifice of a broken heart, the contrite spirit. Romans 12, 1, the sacrifice of of a consecrated body, a life given over to the Lord. Do you remember Mary of Bethany? Mark chapter 14, before the Lord went to the cross, stopped at Bethany. The apostles were there. Simon the leper was there. Mary was there. Martha was there. Mary comes in with her little box of ointment, of spikenard. She breaks it, that alabaster box, and she anoints her Lord and Savior his head and his feet, and she washes his feet with her hair, and they began to murmur, and they began to complain. Remember what the Lord says? Let her alone. She hath wrought a good work in me. You know that little phrase, she hath wrought a good work in me? You know that could also be rendered, she has done something beautiful here. She hath done what she could. It was just that same spirit of sacrifice. Praise, contrite spirit, a life just given to the Lord completely. That little alabaster box was the equivalent of one year's wages. Probably it was purchased by her over many, many years of working, whatever she could put aside, it was set apart for her own burial. But in a moment of time, her heart went out like an express train when the Savior came to her home and she didn't count it too big a sacrifice. Have we lost the spirit of sacrifice? This is how the Psalmist responds to God's deliverance, the aftermath detail, the attendance of the sanctuary, the offering of sacrifice, and then lastly, the showing of sincerity. Verse 13, I will pay thee my vows. To make vows before God, of course, is a very solemn and a very serious thing. Ecclesiastes 5 says, when thou vowest to vow unto God, defer not to pay it for he hath no pleasure in fools. Better that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and and not pay. And often we make vows and promises to the Lord during times of trial. I don't know if there's anything wrong with that. I don't think that there is. Certainly that was the experience of the psalmist here. 
Verse 13, I will pay thee my vows, which my lips have uttered and my mouth have spoken when I was in trouble. And now that the trouble has gone and the Lord has answered his prayer, he says, I'm going to pay my vows. I made a promise to God and I'm going to keep my promise. Have you made a promise to God? Back down there in the years somewhere. Oh, Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. Lord, if you just get me out of this, if you just answer prayer, if you just forgive me, if you just touch my family, if you just heal this sickness, if you just do this, that, and the other, Lord, I promise I'll, I'll read my Bible more, I'll go to church more, I'll pray more. We can be very foolish and say things like that lightly, but if we have made vows and promises to God for his glory and for our good, in God's name, let's keep them. Noel Grant wrote the words, Above thine own ambitions here, and other voices sounding clear, it is the call of God to thee, O leave thine all and follow me. Go through with God thy vows to pay. Thy life upon the altar lay. The Holy Ghost will do the rest and bring to thee God's very best. God knows what he's doing. See, as Spurgeon said, the anvil, the fire, and the hammer are the making of us. The anvil, the fire, and the hammer are the making of us. God knows what he is doing. As for God, his way is perfect. We can trust him tonight. May God write his word upon our hearts and let's just pray together. Father in heaven, we thank thee tonight for this blessed psalm. We pray, O God, that we would be about the business of making his praise glorious. What a calling, Lord, in life. And yet, Lord God, how I feel, feel so, so miserably. I pray, O God, that thou wilt make my life a praise and a prayer to thee. And I pray, Father, that thou wilt encourage everyone that's listening in, those, Lord, who maybe feel that they're in the fiery trial in deep waters tonight, Lord, maybe under the net, maybe affliction laid upon their loins. God, we pray that you'll step in. Bring them out into a wealthy place, Lord. And we pray, O oh God, that whenever all of these calamities are overpassed, Lord, that there'll be a swelling among the ranks of God's people as we meet together publicly. May we come to God's house with sincerity, paying our vows, fulfilling our promises and our duties as Christians. And O oh God, may we have that spirit of sacrifice. Hear and answer prayer and Lead us on with thyself. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for thine everlasting glory. Amen.